Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Evenings at the Conservancy. My name is Melinda Schumann, and I'm here to talk to you about the cane toad. This evening, I'd like to share with you a little bit about the species, the research we're doing here at the Conservancy of Southwest Florida, and a few hints on what you can do in your own communities to keep cane toad numbers down. So cane toads are a highly successful non-native exotic species here in, in Florida. Um, a few keys to their success are their large size, they're toxic in all life stages, the females can produce up to 30,000 eggs in every clutch, and also they're capable of eating just about anything they can fit into their mouths. They're also a, a threat to our native toad species, and this is through predation, competition, and reproductive interference. Another threat to our native species, however, are the people. And this is through misidentification. A lot of people are scared of the cane toads. And because of that, when they see southern toads and they don't know how to tell the difference between these species, they inadvertently kill our native toads. So it's important to know how to properly identify our native species and tell the difference. The most likely species to be misidentified as a cane toad is our native southern toads. When most people think of cane toads, they just think big. That's the first description that comes to mind. However, before cane toads are full-grown adults, they are the same size as our native southern toads. So it's important to know a few features to look for to tell the difference between these species. So when southern toads reach about an inch and a half to two inches in size, once they reach that size, crests start to form on the top of their heads between their eyes. You can see here in this slide, on the left-hand side, we have a picture of the native southern toad. On the right-hand side, we see the invasive cane toad. So the southern toad starts forming crests, and you can see those on the head there. If you look at the cane toad photo, you'll see it's completely flat between the eyes. The other feature you can look for is are the glands. So on the invasive cane toad, the paratoid glands that you find located on that shoulder neck region, they are very large and triangular shaped. However, in the southern toad, these same glands stay very small and oval shaped, and you can see that in the photos here. Now, these are very good features to look for when you're trying to identify which species you happen to have. Um, it's always important to remember, however, that the southern toads will not develop these features until they're about an inch and a half to two inches in size. So we always suggest that people do not attempt to remove toads until they're at least that size where they can be properly identified. The Conservancy is in year three of researching the cane toad. Um, all research has been done in collaboration with the University of Florida and Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Our research consists of three aspects, including radio telemetry tracking, trapping, and diet analysis. For the radio telemetry tracking, radio telemetry belts enable us to be able to follow the toads and track their movements. The majority of cane toad research has been done in Australia, and this is because this is another region in which the species is exotic. Uh, what they found through their research is that the Australian cane toads appear to be very nomadic and they readily move and they move in far distances through various habitats. Our research found actually that our toads here in Southwest Florida, um, they demonstrate high sight fidelity. What this means is that they didn't actually move very far from the original locations in which we found them. We also found that they didn't really leave the urban zone um, into the adjacent natural areas next to our sites. This map here gives you the basic idea of how our toads moved. Um, you can see, so each color represents a toad and the, the, where those dots are, are the locations in which we found them. As you can see, the toads visited a few main water bodies, but beyond that, they never left the general area. A possible explanation for this is that the habitats in which the toads live here in Southwest Florida, those are gonna be the suburban neighborhoods and urban zones, seem to provide for all the needs of these toads. What may be happening is that sprinklers coming on keep the toads moisture levels and balances just the way they need. There's also plenty of places for the toads to retreat during the daytime to get out of the heat and the sun. 
And finally, at night, lights come on and stay on throughout the evenings. What we saw when we were doing our research is empty sidewalks with a bunch of street lights that were on throughout the night. And in that halo of light, the toads would gather. And what's going on is um, bugs are being drawn in and it's basically just delivering food to the cane toads. So in essence, we may be creating the perfect little cane toad paradise here within our own neighborhoods. Now, this is unfortunate for us because the cane toads want to live where we live. However, this could have implications for management. If we develop solid removal and maintenance plans, there, there is potential that we could keep cane toad numbers down in these areas. So we're also testing a trap that was invented and manufactured in Australia. Very briefly, the way that these traps work is they charge by solar panel during the day, and when the sun sets, a lure clicks on. And this lure repeats the cane toad call throughout the night until the battery dies. And this draws both male and female toads to the trap. If you look at the picture on the right, you see those are little finger doors. And what those do is they push inward. So the toads approach the trap, they get curious, they go through those doors. And once they're in the trap, they can't push back out. It's really an ingenious trap design and we're testing just to see the efficacy here in Southwest Florida. We're also looking at the, cane to the diet of the cane toads. Um, within two suburban housing communities here in Naples, just to get start to better understand what the impacts are on our, our native invertebrate communities from this species uh, through predation. So on this slide, you can see two photos of stomach contents to give you an idea of the diversity in which these toads are eating. Each Petri dish represents one stomach and you can see a wide variety of insects on those dishes. Um, you can also see on in the bottom stomach contents, there's a toad. And so this is actually kind of important because oddly enough, the adult cane toads are, are great control for the smaller cane toads. Um, they readily eat the smaller ones and the smaller cane toads have ex actually adapted their behavior to avoid big toads to try and avoid being eaten. Cane toads often trigger a very visceral reaction in us, especially when the health of our pets are involved. Um, it's important to understand that these, these animals are in no way aggressive. And the only way that our pets are harmed is if they attack the toads. And then at that point, the toads just exude this toxin that comes from those glands I pointed out earlier. And if, that, if our pets get that in their mouths, that's where the trouble comes from. Prevention is the key to keeping your pet safe. If you are outside of your yard, you know, it's so important to keep your pets on a leash and especially be mindful during those times of year where the toads are more active. So anytime, spring, summer, um, and then those dawn, dusk, and nighttime times. If you have a dog like I do with that high prey drive, it's important to just always be vigilant. However, with all that said, Sometimes it is necessary to remove cane toads from your own yard, just to know you're staying a little bit safer. Cane toads are living creatures and it's important to treat each cane toad humanely if you do choose to go the route of removing cane toads and euthanizing them. It, it's not only illegal, but it's unethical to remove a toad from one area and take it to another area. So after you've properly identified your toad, uh, to humanely euthanize them, use a cool and freeze method. Uh, this is the one I mostly recommend. It has been scientifically tested to be completely humane for the toads. So when you, you gather your toads, usually you put them in a plastic bag. You can tie that bag shut and put, it in, put the toad in the refrigerator for two to three hours. This anesthetizes the toad. It puts them to sleep. Then the toad can be transferred to the freezer for two or three days. I always recommend the two or three days rather than less time in case the toads wake up. We don't want that to happen. After two or three days, the toad will be dead and you can discard in the trash. Now, as an alternative to the refrigeration step of this method, you can buy a product that contains 20% benzocaine. There's various products you can buy at Walgreens, CVS, pretty much anywhere that contains this. If you Google 20% benzocaine, you'll find the products that contain this. Um, they come in ointments or sprays. And if you put this on the toad, it will anesthetize the toad as well. So you can skip the refrigeration step. And then once the toad is asleep, 
put them right in the freezer. This is great for single family homes, but what are larger communities to do? Um, currently, our best available plan is just systematic cane toad removal, humane euthanasia, and then a solid maintenance plan being put into place. Um, currently, larger communities have two options. One, you could hire a pest control company. This is a great option. My best advice with this is to find a company that has some knowledge in cane toad biology and a good plan for getting rid of the cane toads specifically, and that will be your best bet for success. Secondly, you could start your own volunteer-based toad removal group within the community. Several communities that I'm aware of in both Naples and Bonita Springs are implementing this and with, with some success. Even clubhouses, HOAs are getting into the action by um, setting up a refrigerator and freezer setup where the community can access and humanely euthanize their toads on a larger scale and then get rid of them. There's no scientific evidence today to say that removal of adult cane toads will make a difference in an area. In Australia, the cane toads behave very nomadically. They keep moving through and they move pretty quickly. So in areas where people try to remove the toads in this manner, what happens is that they clear out an area and the toads just move back in pretty quickly. Um, in Southwest Florida though, we think there might be hope because our toads seem to behave a little differently in our research areas. They had these small home ranges and therefore we think that uh, a solid removal plan followed by a maintenance plan might make a difference within community boundaries. I'd like to wrap up with um, a deeper dive looking at a local community that's doing something about their cane toad situation. There's a private gated community here in Naples and the cane toad removal effort is being headed up by Greg Zell. He is a member of the community with a strong biological background and a desire to do something about the toads in his neighborhood. You can see he, the map here on the screen showing the area the team focused on. Members within the area were recruited and everyone was educated on the proper identification of toad species and calls. Uh, just to give you an idea of this community's methods, they did systematic nighttime adult removal and they broke up breeding events. This happened three to four times a week, especially during the beginning and through those really heavy cane toad nights during spring and summer months. They also did neighborhood patrol at least one time a week. And this is driving around and just collecting toads from the front of houses and in communal areas. They finally, they did daytime tadpole removal using modified mini minnow traps and also netting. They did not collect on off months. Um, you notice here in Southwest Florida, we don't really see toads around very much during November and December months. So they really did nothing during those months. And it's about a year later now, and they feel like their cane toad population is actually very stable. And now that the spring months are starting up again, they just do a weekly maintenance plan. The long term success of a project like this really isn't known. However, what they're seeing on the ground within their community is that they're noticing a dramatic drop in visual sightings of toads. And also the noise level of the cane toads has been reduced, if even eliminated in a lot of areas. And if you happen to live next to a breeding pond with cane toads, you know what a big deal that is. That, that can make a very a big difference in your peace of mind not hearing that noise constantly through the, the rainy season. So this is not the only community taking on this charge and more information is being learned every year. The more the communities are doing this and we kind of see how it's working here in Southwest Florida. The fact is this species is here to stay. More research will be needed to know the long-term effects the species is having on our native wildlife here in Southwest Florida. Um, for more information on anything I discussed here today, please go to our website. The Conservancy of Southwest Florida has a cane toad page and you can find a lot of information on the species there. Uh, really great resources you can click on to go to. And also some fantastic videos that were done by the University of Florida that show good hands-on methods for working with cane toads, especially if you're not already familiar. 
Thank you so much for joining me. I hope this presentation taught you something you didn't already know about cane toads here in Naples. 